Welcome to the Sisterhood of Sweat. I am here today with Michael Unbroken. From homeless to hero, Michael Unbroken is the founder of Think Unbroken, best-selling author, award-winning speaker, podcast host, coach, and advocate for adult survivors of childhood trauma. Since 2016, Michael has empowered over 100,000 trauma survivors to get out of the vortex, learn to love themselves, and become the hero of their own stories. Michael has spoken in over 80 countries, won investments from undercover billionaire Grant Cardone, and is on a mission to end generational trauma in his lifetime. In today's episode, I am going to start us off with a quote by Alex Benayan of The Third Door. He wrote The Third Door. Shame can only live in secrecy. The second you speak something out loud, it doesn't have power over you anymore. And you guys have heard me talk about this many times on this podcast, but you're when you're keeping secrets for years and years, the shame that you feel from something somebody else may have done to you, it lives in that secrecy. So telling somebody, you don't have to tell an audience, but telling somebody really frees you from that shame, calling it out, saying it out, it's huge. And today is a very touching episode about Michael's life and his childhood trauma. He's an abuse survivor and it it is a little, it's very sensitive. So you may not want your kids listening. Uh, it, it, It really was touching. And I think it's a very important topic because a huge amount of us and I am also a you know some a trauma survivor. I've had PTSD and, and many things like that. He talks a lot about healing from that. But what I was saying is that many people that have suffered from any kind of a trauma, whether it's a sexual abuse, physical abuse, any type of abuse as children, you know, first of all, it's not your fault. And second of all, you carry it into adulthood unless you get some type of counseling, healing, and it's, it's something you weren't able to speak about and possibly never learned to speak about. So how could you possibly heal from it? We carry a lot of those things in the back of the brain and bringing it to the front is a great way to get it out. So this was really a great episode today. I hope that anybody out there that is feeling broken, that you find that you can think unbroken and have healing and prosperity and go on and have a great life because it is not what has happened to us, but it's what we do about the things that have happened to us that define us. And so this is a very sensitive episode. Let me know what resonated with you. And as always, you guys keep on keeping on. So let's just tune into this episode with Michael Unbroken. I am very excited to welcome Michael Unbroken to the Sisterhood of Sweat today. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, my friend. Very excited to be here with you today. And when I said that, I was just like, oh my gosh, that's my oldest son's name, Michael. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So I was just like, Uh, I already feel like we're old friends, even though this is the first time today we're speaking, and this is going to be a powerful episode. Everybody uh, just be ready for some takeaways and some deep dives that we're going to do today, and I just want to really start with introducing you and your story to my audience, uh, because I know there's so many of us that have been affected by things that have happened to us in the past, uh, relationships, maybe things that happened when we were children. 
and you have a lot of knowledge and you have been there, done that, and you've come out as thriving now after all of the surviving you've done. So can you just walk us through some of your story so people understand where we're coming from today? Yeah, absolutely. You know, when I was, I was four years old, my, my mother, who was a, a drug addict and alcoholic, um, she actually cut off my right index finger. And that kind of starts baseline, right? And people's first reaction is always like, whoa. And, and the thing I now understand that I didn't understand then, of course, is like that was just this repeat of trauma. And my stepfather was super abusive. The kind of guy you pray is never your, your stepfather. And, you know, he would, he would hurt my brothers and I, he put me in the hospital a couple of times. Right. And so the, the most dangerous place in my day-to-day -day life as a kid was my own home. By the time that we were 10 years old, I had lived with like 30, like three zero different families getting bounced around place to place to place. We were always getting evicted. We were constantly homeless. Like it was just a part of the growing up. When I was 12, I got high for the first time, drunk at 13. By 15, I was expelled from school for selling drugs. And, you know, I was running the streets. I was running with guns, stealing cars, breaking into houses, like doing all those things. And luckily, I got put into a last chance program. And I still didn't graduate high school on time. Basically, they handed me the diploma, like, dude, good luck. And and in that, I was, I was in this moment of looking at my life and was like, what is the solution for poverty, for homelessness, for abuse? And I thought it was money. And so I made this decision. By the time I'm 21, I want to make $100,000 a year legally. Now, the legal part was very important because today, my three childhood best friends have been murdered. My family, I have family in prison for life. I've been in handcuffs. Like I knew the path I was heading down if I didn't make some massive changes. And so I started learning skill. I started learning and figuring out things like resumes and, um, you know, how to do interviews and cover letters and blah, blah, blah. And sure enough, by the time I'm heading into my 21st birthday, I land a job with a Fortune 10 company, no high school diploma, no college education, and I start making six figures. Well, the thing happened to me that happens to people who've never had money before, and it completely destroyed my life. And I found myself at, you know, 25, 26 years old, 350 pounds, smoking two packs of cigarettes a day and drinking myself to sleep. And one day I wake up and it's 11 o'clock in the morning. I'm smoking a joint, eating chocolate cake and watching the CrossFit games. And I was like, man, this is rock bottom. <laughs> Quite a combination. I, I, was, I was like, this is it. This is as low as it gets for me. And I, I went in the bathroom and I was looking at myself in the mirror and I just, I did not recognize the reflection. And I remembered being eight years old and the water company came and turned our water off. It's like blistering hot Indiana summer. And, and look, the reality is our water was always getting turned off. Our electricity was getting turned off. Our heat was getting turned off in the winter. We were getting evicted. It was just a part of the norm. And on this one particular day when the water company turned the water off, I went in the backyard I grabbed this little blue bucket and I walked across the street to our neighbor's house. I turned on the spigot on the side of their home. And for the first time I stole water. And I remember in that moment, I was like, when I'm a grown up, this isn't going to be my life. And to an extent it wasn't because I had, you know, I had an $80,000 car and I had this awesome apartment and all these clothes and all this stuff. But I was still ultimately that that lost, hurt little boy, right? I hadn't done any of yeah. the work. And, yeah. and as I looked at myself in the mirror, I asked myself, what are you willing to do to have the life that you want to have? And the words, no excuses, just results, just started reverberating through my body. And what that really meant to me was it's time to stop negotiating with yourself. And fast forward 11 years later, here I am talking to you. And, and that was a in depth process of healing, of growing, of changing, of transformation, of doing the things. And, and ultimately my mission today is to empower people to understand, you know, that it doesn't matter what we come from. You can still become the hero of your own story. Oh my gosh, so much. And I'm just going to read a small excerpt out of your book that just about tore my heart out because I could just 
I could just feel your pain in the reality of the statement. By the time I was 11, I had been stripped entirely of my childhood between the beatings, belittlement, molestation, bedwetting, shame, tattered clothes, foodless nights, bullying, and homelessness. I was ready to kill myself. What, you know, I mean, I just know there, there are people out there that can relate to some of this because, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I was, a, I'm a domestic violence survivor and, uh, and, 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 you know, my children were the reason why I left. It should have been my own self first, because I was getting all the beatings, but it was my children. And when I hear this from you, it makes me celebrate the decision of walking away because they would have had a lifetime of this type of thing. And how did you finally get the strength? Because that is a hell of a lot to go through to be able to pull yourself up and and be this person that not only did you overcome, but now you're empowering other people to overcome. Well, you know, it wasn't, none of it, I don't think was my intention. Like I never set out to, to do what I do today. Right. It was never on the the table. It, It came by proxy. And what I mean by that is, you know, my, my whole thing was about, can I get to this place in my life where I just feel okay with who I am? Right. Can I get to this place in my life where I just can reconcile not only the, the things that I did myself, but the things that happened to me, like, you know, cause there, there's an aspect to it here where, you know, it's very easy to play the victim. I did that for a very long time. That's mm-hmm. how you end up in that place that I was in my mid twenties. Mm-hmm. I blamed everyone. I blamed you. Mm-hmm. I blamed society, my parents, mm-hmm. the school, mm-hmm. But I never like looked at myself and said, wait a second, some of this is your fault, man. Like you've got to understand like your decisions have put you in this situation. There Mm -hmm. are consequences, both good Mm -hmm. and bad for everything that you do, right? Mm -hmm. Equal and opposite reactions. And I wasn't making decisions at that point in my life that were to my benefit. The choices I were making were all to my detriment. But here's like, Linda, here's the thing you got to understand though. When, when you come up in a traumatic household and to the quote that you read from the book, you are stripped. But I think now writing that book a few years ago, what the truth is that I now definitely better understand even more probably than ever, especially with working with hundreds and hundreds of people is, you know, you're stripped of your humanity. It wasn't my childhood that was taken. It was my, my, my being, you know, because you come up in this place where you're told you're not good enough, you're not strong enough, you're not capable enough. And then you have teachers like you color the moon purple and they go, who do you think you are? Walk on the right side of the hallway, go to lunch when we tell you to raise your hand to go to the bathroom. And, and all of this time, like as a kid in your developmental age, you're, you're trying to step into your intuition so that you can learn to understand who you are in the environment that you're present. But the reality is that if you come from a traumatic background, you don't ever get to do that because the most dangerous thing that you can ever do is be yourself. That to me was what I've come to understand at a better level of depth than ever before. And so the the process wasn't about me getting to this place where I am now. The process was, can I know who I am? Because at 27 years old, I'll never forget this. I recognize I have zero self-esteem. I have no confidence. I don't believe in myself. And the worst part of that was I never did. And so I had to learn how to become a human being. Like, this is not to be crass, but the, the Michael sitting here having this conversation with you, this is a realization of the idea of the person I thought I could be 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Right. And, and that became this uphill battle of, can I show up for myself? Can I do the hard things? Can I say yes to what I want to say yes to and no to what I want to say no to? Can I establish values and boundaries and personal statements and just really step into this place in my life where I took ownership and, and, and it's really about this. 
can you acknowledge the reality that bad things happen? And that doesn't make you culpable. And I want to be clear about that. Culpability, it's not your fault. Like you cannot be blamed for being a child who didn't have parents who were supposed to take care of them. But at some point, and this is where it gets difficult, and this is where it gets hard for people to palate, and it, it's, a, it's the hardest pill to swallow, at some point, you are destroying your own life. And that's what you have to come to realization about, because until you do, nothing in your life is going to be different. And it takes as much effort and energy to destroy your life as it does to build it up. But building it up requires stepping through fear because you've never been allowed to be who you are. So it's unknown territory as you go down that path of discovery. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, you, you just said so much because it is like we can be victimized. You were, you were definitely victimized when you were young, which sets up a whole chain of events um, because of the messages that you're receiving in your you know, in your childlike brain about yourself and you're believing these things that people have said about you. Uh, and, and, but you know, that's the problem is they aren't actually true. And we're believing the story that people said that we weren't capable, that we weren't strong, that we were unlovable. And at some point when you did take ownership, you realized that you can be a victim, but you, you can be victimized, but you don't have to live as a victim. You took responsibility for your decisions, for your life, for the rest of your life. And anybody out there listening to the sound of my voice, you can 100% change your story. I did, Michael has, and we have been through a lot. And it isn't what you go through. It's, it's what you do about what you went through. It's what decisions you make after the fact and getting yourself some help and some support um, goes a long way. And I love this part in your book when you say that when you look in the mirror now that the wailing police siren has turned into a powerful yet gentle whisper of a breeze that tells me, you are strong, you are capable, you are loved. It is through your story that others will find their light. It is through your power that change will happen. I just got the chills. Go forward without fear because today could be the best day of your life. And I just want you to tell people kind of in essence what I said and what, what how, can, how can people change their story today? Um, no matter what they've been through, what are some tools to help people that feel broken out there? Yeah, you know, I, I think first and foremost, this, this is an analogy that I, I shared earlier this spring, and it resonated with a lot of people. And I, I think it started like this, you know, healing trauma is like cleaning up other people's trash from your front yard. It's not your trash, but it is your front yard. And, and that's the truth about it, right? You're, you're going to have to go through this process if you want what's on the other side. You're going to have to clean up other people's messes. And it's not fair. Like, I, I hate it, right? Like, to me, I'm like, this is the most asinine thing in the human experience is having this conversation right now. You know, and that's why I'm so driven because I just, I'm like, look, the reality is you have to build yourself. And the only way you're ever going to build yourself is by doing difficult things. But you hear this all the time. And the thing where I, where I believe that people miss the mark in having this conversation is they miss the element about this concept of mindset. Now, people talk about mindset all the time in the kind of spaces we interact in, right? Mindset, 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 right? <laughs> You've heard it so many times. <laughs> Nobody tells you what it means, though. So let me tell you what it means, because this becomes the precursor for everything next in your life. You can't see it, but in front of me is a giant sign that says mindset is everything. Mindset is this. What you think becomes what you speak. What you speak become your actions and your actions become your reality. And right now, 
some of you are saying things to yourself that if you said to me would get you punched in the face or arrested and you expect yourself to be successful. But think about this. Where does that come from? That negative self-talk, that limiting belief, that part of you that just is so self-deprecating, right? If it's true that we're the sum total of all of our experiences leading to this moment, then that would mean that everything that's ever happened to us informs us. Every time somebody said, you're not good enough, you're a loser, look at you, you're dumb, all of those things, we can pile them up and they just sit there on a shelf. And then we start reiterating that to ourselves. And suddenly we're in our own way. Hmm. Okay. So what do you do about that? If mindset's everything. What do you actually do about that? I think that you have to understand this. Our, our brains are incredibly plastic. Neuroplasticity has been proven time and again. You have the ability to change the way you think about possibility in your life, but you need a tool to be able to do that. So I'm going to give you one. What you do is you take a pen and a piece of paper, arguably the most powerful tools in the arsenal of anyone's healing journey. And you're going to write this down and you're going to convince yourself that this is true by telling it to yourself every single day. I am the kind of person who is kind to myself. I am the kind of person who is kind to myself. Why does that matter? Because if you're acting through the scope of kindness, that will be a reflection of the reality that you live in. Because you'll start thinking about this. I am the kind of person who is kind to myself. And then when you are faced with obstacles, with choices and with decisions that are outside of the norm that you know will push you in the direction that you need to go, you will say, what would a kind person for themselves do in this moment? Would they push themselves? Would they face the fear? Would they go through the trial to get to the other side? The answer is going to be yes. And then you're going to start making those actions. And then those actions on a long enough timeline are going to reframe your reality. Because again, mindset is all about this. What you think becomes what you speak. What you speak become your action. Your action become your reality. So on a long enough timeline, if you simply just take this scope and you move one degree in a different direction every single day than where you're at right now, then in a year, you've moved 365 steps towards changing your life but it all starts with how you're talking to yourself. Oh yeah, that's huge. Self-talk uh, so much when in my studio, I have a fitness studio for women and that is one of the biggest things that I preach, I'll say, <laughs> is self-talk, self-talk because it's you're, the, you're listening to your own words more than you listen to anybody else. You, you, when you speak those words, you're listening and your words are powerful. They can be healing or they can be destroying. And so like listening to what you actually say, I've had people write that down so they could actually see what they were saying to themselves. Be, because would you say that to someone you love and why don't you love yourself enough not to speak to yourself that way? You know, it's got to start with loving yourself because loving yourself then translates into everything in your life and I love this quote in your book so much I don't know why I'd never seen it by before because I'm a huge fan of Maya Angelou but I love this quote because I think I've kind of lived my life by this I can be changed by what happens to me but I refuse to be reduced by it and I remember when I got out of the situation with my two children and I had made up my mind that digging ditches for a living would be better than living the way that I had been living. So I was getting out and, and, uh, it was just me and my children. And I just remember thinking, um, this has happened to me, but this does not define who I am. And anybody out there, regardless of what, what has happened to you, you are not what has happened to you and your circumstances do not have to dictate who you are, define who you are, or have anything to do with the present moment and the future moment. 
Th those decisions can be completely up to you. So how do you, how did you find your way um, and to just realize what was your moment when you just realized that you could change your story? Well, you know, I, I think it's a, a combination of things. And when I was a kid, it was very much, I always looked at my life and I said, I cannot wait to be an adult. Like the only thing I ever wanted to do as a kid was be a grown up. That's it. I had no other dream. That was, that was my dream, be a grown up. Because I knew that once I was a grown up, I could change everything, right? So even as a kid, I knew this. But what happened as a grown up, I wasn't moving in a direction that was towards my benefit. And so it was just, it was actually more so a series of really events that were detrimental to my life that became the catalyst for change. And, and I, I don't think that there was a singular moment. It was an accumulation of multiple moments over 26 years. And, and ultimately, I think that like a lot of things, it just became, there was this experience of like the, the last straw that broke the camel's back, if you will, right? And you go, okay, I've had enough of myself. I've had enough. Do something about it. But the change came, if I were to name a moment, the change came in making a decision. I decided in the same way that you decided. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's you all said, about that decision. Bitches. I would rather dig it. I get that, right? Make a decision about your life. I would rather, look, I'll tell you this. I would rather be anything other than the thing that's destroying my life, right? And so what are you willing to do to have that? And you have to make decisions. You have to make choices. And people are so stuck in indecision. And that is the space of failure. If you don't decide, like you can't think about changing your life. You can't try to change your life. You can't shoulda, coulda, woulda change your life. You can only change your life or not. You can only transform or not. You can only do the workout or not. You're not going to magic yourself in anything. There's no Disney moment right? This is what people have to understand. They're always waiting for somebody. They're waiting for the perfect moment. They're waiting for the thing. There is no Disney moment. Nobody is coming to save you. You want to create massive change in your life. You're going to have to do hard things. You're going to have to decide. You're going to have to wake up at five o'clock in the morning. You're going to have to stay up late. You're going to have to go to therapy when you don't want to. You're going to have to read the personal development books and go to the conference and borrow money from a friend so you can afford the flight. You're going to have to figure it out. You're going to have to stop making excuses. Like that's so hard for people to understand. And I wish it wasn't. We can use excuses all day long. They're right here. By any means, please, you're welcome to. No one's going to blame you for doing that. But if you're sitting here and you're miserable in your life, you hate your job, you hate your relationship, you, you hate all these things that keep you awake at night, and yet you make excuses for it, you don't get a complaint. That's the hard thing, right? Because that's the hard reality. I've never in my life seen anyone's life change without a tremendous amount of effort. And that oh effort starts with decision making. You had to make a decision, Linda. And in that decision, you took action. Action is everything in this thing, in this game. Without action, there is no change. And guess what? Here's the really interesting part. Change only happens when you make change happen. And yeah. the fear that you have that holds you back, we all have it. We all have it. We don't know what's going to happen, but I can promise you this, you're going to die. And on your deathbed, in that last blink of an eye, that last breath, that last moment before whatever happens next, you're going to have a thought. And if you have a thought of, I wish I would have, then you did not live. Oh my gosh. And it's so funny that you said that because I was on the way home from the studio. I was listening to Colin Powell's funeral and I was just like blown away by the things people were saying about him and how, how great 
of a man he was and how how awesome the things people were saying about him was and that they're basically having commentary like they would have commentary at a great sporting event and I just thought about when someday we are all going to be laid to rest at some point what do you want your story to read because it is up to you it is up to us it is up to us what our story is going to read did we like i love brendan burchard where he talks about when he almost died in a car crash it was the thing that came to him was did i live did i love did i matter and when we are at the end of all this we are the deciders this is our our movie our role our life and it's up to us what is going to happen what in the future is going to happen it may not have been up to us it wasn't up to me when i was eight years old and molested by by a close family member that wasn't up to me but what i've decided to do about it and when i decided to free myself from shame of carrying that for freaking 55 years um that was a decision and it impacted other people's lives that needed to free themselves from shame. And it wasn't even our shame to carry is the thing. So like, how do you wanna be spoken about someday is, is up to you. And it has nothing to do with what has happened to you. It has everything to do with what you do about it. And boy, you just bring up so many good points. And, and I really love that you are in here talking about, um, you know, how to heal yourself from trauma and that you had six principles of healing trauma as well as that you needed accountability. And I just want you kind of to dive into that because I really want to give people some steps that could help them today. Yeah, I, I think step one is be honest with yourself. Like that's step one. Right. And, and, and that's a hard reality because guess what, when you go and you look in that mirror, you're going to find out the truth because you can't hide from yourself as much as you want to, you can't hide from the reality as much as you want to, you can try to numb it away. You can do like what I did. You can go to drugs and alcohol and food and sex and all of those things, but it's not going to go away and it's going to come up. It's going to show itself. It's going to be there waiting for you, looking at you, taunting you, saying, when are you going to do something about this? And until you do, it's not going to go away. You can't run from life, right? And, and that's the hardest part about this. You have to get real with yourself. You have to have a moment of reckoning with yourself. Because look, here's the reality. Nobody else cares about your problems. And that's not to be crass. I promise you, everyone has their own thing going on. Everyone has their own experience, their own life. They're trying to go through this day to day. And when you try to have other people solve your problems, they never get solved, right? When have you ever ignored a problem or had someone else try to solve something for you and it got fixed? Never. It doesn't work that way. And so the thing is, can you get honest? Like unabashedly. Like nakedly, can you look at where you are in your life and be okay with saying, I'm not good enough yet? Because this is a process, like life is evolution. If you are the same person tomorrow that you are today, are you paying attention? Are you trying? Are you pushing yourself? And look, I want to be clear too, because people will always say like, Hey, but we're trauma survivors. We should take it easy on ourselves. We had so much, but I always ask this question. If you want to reach your goals and if you want to create the life that you believe you're capable of, ask this, am I taking care of myself or am I taking it easy on myself? Because mm. I assure you, those mm. are not the same thing. Mm. And, and when you're taking it easy on yourself, you're going to get easy results. You're going to get a life that's unfulfilling. You're going to be motivated. 
You're going to blame everybody around you. And when you're taking care of yourself, you're going to do the thing that you need to do because you need to do it. Is it going to the doctor? Is it going to therapy? Is it not working today? Is it whatever it is because you're honoring your truth? But that place, that taking it easy on yourself, that letting yourself down, you've been playing that game. You've done that. You've had that moment. Where you're like, today is the day, but then tomorrow comes. And then you're like, no, no, today's the day. And then tomorrow comes. And then suddenly you're like, wow, I don't trust myself because I do not hold true to the promises that I make. So to make a decision, decide, decide who you want to be and move towards that. And the only way that you're going to get there is through doing it. Like, that's the thing. Like, I wish it were easier. I wish there was like a magic pill I could give you. I wish there was a single sentence that I could say that's going to magically change your whole life, but I don't have one and you're not going to find one. Trust me. I read 70 years. I haven't found it yet. And I'll tell you this, like the <laughs> truth is, the truth is that mirror, when you go in there and you look at it and you look at yourself and you have that moment, you can't lie to yourself. Mm, 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 mm. So powerful. And I know a lot of people are very, very affected. You know, if you don't do the inner work, you're so affected by the things that it doesn't have to be as horrific as what has happened to, to Michael. It could just be somebody was very negative in your ear and talking smack about you, your whole childhood. And you could be carrying that in your brain and you think it's you talking to yourself, but it really is just a learned process. You learned it. The person did it to you, then you did it to yourself and you're still doing it to yourself. How, how can people today unlearn these things? Because I really believe what you believe about yourself is more powerful than any other force, like what you believe about yourself. And so how, how can we inter interrupt this narrative of what people are saying to themselves and, and get them to start a new narrative. You're going to have to prove yourself otherwise, right? You're mm -hmm. going to have to go and do the things like, like it's really about action. It's about taking this idea about mindset, which we laid out, coupling that with decisions, being honest with yourself and following through because it's a rebuilding process. Right. And for someone, if you were like me at 27 years old, a decade ago, it was a building for the first time process and it's scary and it's uncomfortable and it's weird. Right. And you're like, whoa, I'm figuring out who I am. But in that becomes strength. It's power. It's it's cor courage. Right. It's the capacity to be who you want to be. But it's not if you don't do the things. It, you're never going to mindset yourself into something great. You're, you know, you're going to have to push yourself. And when you fall, look, look, here's something I want you to think about also. When you falter, when you fail, which I promise you, you will, like as much as I know the sun's going to come up tomorrow, I know that I'm going to make a mistake. And instead of beating yourself up in that moment, can you simply acknowledge it? Can you look at it and go, this is data. This is data. This isn't necessarily a reflection of who I am as a human being. This is me understanding that when I tried something new, something different, something challenging, it didn't work. And so because of that, I can now create a new framework around still continuing to move to my goal. See, most, most people get caught up in the failures and they let them cripple them. Whereas what I'm always thinking about is, can you be solution oriented? Can you find a way to get the thing that you're trying to move towards, regardless of the number of obstacles, while simultaneously being incredibly patient. Because here's what's really funny about all this. It might take you 37 years there, right? And so it's about a combination of all of these things. It's a day in and a day out. Can you build momentum? 
because momentum comes through taking action. And the more momentum you have, the more forward progression that you have. And eventually you start to reach these, what I will call plateaus or new baselines of what you're capable of doing. And so every time you reach one of those, you go to a new level, right? A great analogy. Think about this. You're in the gym. The first time you, you do a push up, you can do a half a push up, right? It's almost yeah. impossible. You can barely even get the half push up in, but you keep going at it. And a week later, you can do one. And a month later, you can do eight. And the two years later, you can do 200, right? Yes. There's a process to this. It's the same thing, right? It's the same thing. Can you just keep going? Because you have to make up your mind. You have to decide whether or not you're going to do it. Because here's the thing. Like when you wake up in the morning, you've got decisions to make. What are you going to do today to live life on your terms, to become the hero of your own story and to act in accordance with a person who is kind to themselves? I love that so much. And I know that when we've been through all this type of stuff, it can really leave scars and people feel shame. And like I said before, you know, I was carrying all that shame because I was protecting family members. I was hiding, you know, that deep down inside because that's what I had to do was gloss over it. Uh, when I was eight. And so uh, how can we help people with releasing that shame today? Because I think that it affects people more than they realize the shame of the secret. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's a very difficult question to answer, right? Because mm -hmm. it's different for everyone. Mm -hmm. And, and I think shame is a part of the human experience, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but yeah. there's also the aspect of understanding like whose shame are you carrying? And that's different, right? You know, I, I carried the shame of secrets of family. That's not my burden to carry. Mm -hmm. Think about this. Like if right. I put a, if I put a brick in your hand and mm -hmm. I said, you have to carry this brick with you every single day. Mm -hmm. Everywhere you go, no matter what, to dinner, to the gym, on a date, to bed, in the shower, in the car, everywhere. You had to take this brick with you everywhere. And it was so heavy. It was a thousand pounds, right? How long would you carry that brick? How long would you do that before you started to figure out a way to let go of it, right? And that mm -hmm. letting go process is different for everyone, for journaling, right? I was doing therapy. I had a coach. I was in personal development, but it was the journal. It was that pen and that paper. That's where I started to let go of it. For you, it might be therapy. For somebody else, it might be, uh, it might be in the meditation and in the, in the quiet of allowing yourself the space to process the reality of what happened. But eventually, I, I think that everyone has the ability to let it go. But it is that. It is a process of letting it go. And, and putting it where it needs to be. And that's on a shelf somewhere far removed from, her, from where you are today. And there's a million books on shame. There's a million TED Talks on shame. There's a, all that stuff about it. But I think what people really have to sit with is that it's a part of the human experience. You're not alone in this. And chances are with 8 billion people on planet Earth, that someone else has had this experience too. So maybe you just need to talk about it. Shame oh goes gosh, away yeah. when you stop keeping it in yourself. You put that into the world, you talk about it in the right aspects. Like, I mean, you know, if you don't go dump it on Facebook, that's, I don't know about that. That may not be beneficial to right. you, mm -hmm. but being in the right rooms, the right support groups, the right therapist, the right coach, get it off, let go of that brick. Mm, so good. So good. And I, I just found for me, I actually, my, my life changed from, I never even knew what podcasting was. I'd never heard a podcast, but for some reason, um, Lewis house was actually on somebody else's podcast talking about his experience, um, with being molested and, like just him coming out about that and talking about it and that it just like completely changed my life and just one listen to that that show and 
I think, you know, I realized podcasting is a very powerful tool. It's why I do it. And I realized in that instance that shame can only live in secret. And that when you talk about it, you free yourself from shame. And in that moment, Lewis freed himself from shame, but he freed other people because then they got brave to free themselves of shame. And, and I just really am a strong believer that that shame lives in secret and that once you free yourself of that shame, it's like a weight is lifted off of you, of, off your chest, and you just feel a whole lot lighter. And um, so I know it's a reality that many people feel it. And you may not even really understand it or acknowledge it until you've heard somebody else talking about it. That's why these type of conversations are so powerful and they're, they're so, so important. And I really want to ask you, because I feel like this is such a clue, is that you just decided to take ownership. And there's so many times in our lives that we can complain, we can blame we can justify because really bad things have happened to us. But if you want to change the game, you have to take this ownership of your life and how you're showing up and the decisions you're making. How can you help everybody out there to ask themselves questions that, that, that cause them to take ownership? Yeah, you know, it's it's such a, a balance of everything that we've talked about because ownership, again, it's not culpability, right? It doesn't make you responsible for those dark things that happen. But if you keep pretending that they didn't, nothing's going to be different. So, you know, in that, it's it comes to this, right? When, when I sit down in the morning and I write in my journal, the very first thing I write every single day is face my fear. And I don't, I don't even know what that fear is that day. The day just started. I have no idea, right? But it's the first thing that I work because I know it's coming. I know it's inevitable. I know something about life is going to feel uncomfortable and different and fearful. But I have to face it. I acknowledge that. And I take ownership over that. But I also take ownership over the mistakes I make and the victories. Let me tell you this. One of the things that people really fail to do in this journey is to acknowledge the wins that they have. It's okay to celebrate yourself. It's okay to be proud of yourself. It's okay to have this moment of giving yourself what you need. And sometimes that's acknowledgement. Like, I did a good job. I showed up today. I did the thing I said I was going to do. I built my future. I went to therapy. I did the thing. Like, whatever it is, it doesn't matter what it is, right? You got to own that too. But there's also owning your emotions, right? Some so easy to be angry. Like that's an easy emotion, right? But but can you be happy? Whatever that means. These all mean something different for everyone. But can you feel the full scope and range of the human experience? And I, I think a lot of it really just comes down to looking at life and being present with what is happening. You know, and I know that's a, a, a catch-all word that people are using right now, but but presence is just simply pausing for a second and being like, I did it or I didn't do it. So what do I need to do to make it happen? And, and that's ownership. I think it's just a parlay of all of these concepts coming together and just showing up for yourself day in and day out. Mm -mm -mm. So, so, so good. Yeah. I, I'm sure you had post-traumatic stress disorder after everything you've been through. Uh, I think like I know I did. And, and still sometimes uh, I could be, you know, still I could fall into that where I feel intimidated or afraid or, or some of these things that actually really relate and trigger back to the, the trauma you, you've been through. What, what's some tips for people that are still being triggered, even though they've made this decision to move forward, be accountable you know, they're living their best lives, but they're still feeling triggered by things from their past. Yeah, well, you know, skills have utility, right? And, and meditation is a skill, journaling is a skill. Um, you know, yoga is a skill, working out and being inside of your body is a skill, breathing is a skill, 
right? These skills, they all have utility. They all serve a purpose, especially if you're, if you are triggered, right? And, and I have those experiences too, but what I'm always thinking about is, can I mitigate the impact? Something that used to trigger me in this way or, or, or send me into this, this spiral that would last for, you know, three months now lasts for like three seconds, right? Because it's about that idea of presence. So go into this place where you start to learn, like, how do you actually get into the parasympathetic nervous system, right? And one of the best ways that you do that in that rest, digest, recover, the opposite of the sympathetic, where it's all about your adrenaline's coursing through your veins, you're freaking out, your amygdala's all over the place about survival. That's that place of being triggered. So how do you move out of that and into the parasympathetic? You take a moment and you pause and you breathe and you evaluate your environment and you ask yourself, am I safe right now? Because look, it happens to me all the time. I'm like walking down the street or I'm in an airplane or this memory pops in out of nowhere or that smell or that thing. Like it always happens, right? But what tools can I use to mitigate the impact of that and to reduce the impact of that? Well, I know I can take a moment and breathe and close my eyes and ask myself, am I safe right now? Right. You just got to you have to understand that there are so many elements to the human experience that it's going to happen. You can't run from it. Like, I mean, I've been doing this work for a very, very long time and it still happens. But you yeah. have to leverage the tools that you have at your disposal. And that's what's most important. That's ownership. And I really, I love that. And, you know, it, it, you wouldn't be, I think, like, I had to pretend, like, you know, through my childhood, many, many things, that nothing had ever happened. <laughs> like, go on and expect it not to tell and just... um like nothing had happened. And I really think I still, to this day, I just recognized that the other day. So your healing process is a long-term thing. It doesn't just happen overnight. You're going to have realizations all the way up until I'm 59. Um, so you're going to have these realizations of things. And, you, you know, I just realized the other day that I, I just told a story the other day I'd never told. Uh, because I was still being that person that was expected not to tell. And I just, I feel like that pretending like nothing has happened sometimes carries on into your life. And, and you, you've got to at some point recognize, yes, um, I need to talk about this. Something has happened to me and um, I need to let this trauma out because I think you just carry it with you. Um, in the back of your brain somewhere. And that's part of what I think sometimes triggers the post-traumatic stress. Yeah, absolutely. So good today. Well, what would you like to impart to the audience before we go, before we sign off today that would help them just like maybe three tips to help them and overcoming and understanding their past and just moving on to a brighter future. Yeah, totally. And, and look, it's, it's very simple. You're not alone. Ask for help and do the work. So good. I love it. Three in that you couldn't be any more clear. It, it doesn't have to be complicated, right? No, it does not. So good. And I just want to tell you, I just, oh my gosh, I was just, I was reading your story and I could just, oh my goodness, feel the pain. Just, I could feel it as some, you know, one survivor to another. And I just have to salute you in the changes you've made and acknowledge you so much for putting your story out there because that had to take courage and also for having the guts and the gumption to change your entire life. And I'm sure somewhere out there today, somebody else's life will change just from listening to your story. Well, I appreciate that, my friend. And thank you for the opportunity to tell it. And thanks for everybody for listening. And where can they reach you, Michael, and get more about the, you know, becoming unbroken? 
Yeah, absolutely. So I'm on all the social media at Michael Unbroken. And you can check out Think Unbroken Podcast. It's on all the platforms. Just Think Unbroken Podcast on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. And I just want to thank everybody for listening. And thank you again, Michael, for telling your story. Bye, everyone. My pleasure.